Hey, hey, everybody, and welcome back to the board meeting. Today, we're doing another RNR episode. You know the drill. Reviews and ratings of all the different games that I've been playing the last two weeks with friends, family, and even solo. And I just realized, I've never really mentioned this, but these are only the games that I've played the last couple weeks that I haven't been I haven't talked about on reviews and ratings before. So this week I'm talking about 15 different games. I actually played 23 different games, but eight of them I had already talked about in a previous R&R. So we're not trying to repeat ourselves on these R&Rs. Uh, let's talk about that first game though, Azul. Azul is the immensely popular family weight game of drafting and laying tiles onto your own player board. Players earn points for how they lay their tiles down and for certain patterns and sets. You will only have so much room for these tiles, so if you do take a stack of tiles, you can't use all of them. Any of the excess will be lost and go for negative points. This game really was the talk of board games for quite a while when it was released, and I think it was well deserved. It is a nice family game that I myself have actually played with my family and board game friends alike, and everyone seems to enjoy it. I give Azul a 7 rating which it has dropped down a bit from where I used to rate it, but I think it's just that I've played it so many times. But this is a game I would definitely suggest to almost anybody. Moving on to the next game, Last Defense. Last Defense is an app-assisted real-time cooperative game where players have 20 minutes to defeat several monsters that are assaulting their city. The app will tell you where these monsters will spawn and move to. You must clear the rubble around the city and recruit different specialists that will help you defeat the certain monsters. You will be rolling dice to determine how much you can move and how many tools you can grab to let you clear the rubble. This is definitely a kids game and my nephew and I played this three times last week. I was somewhat bored throughout the game thinking it was way too easy to defeat the monsters and when I asked my nephew what he thought of the game, surprisingly my nine-year-old nephew, who by the way likes cooperative games to be very easy, said it was too easy and didn't really want to play this game anymore. So I would rate this game a 5.5, but I think if you are a family that has younger children, they might find this game to be very enjoyable. Going to the next game, Knoxford. Knoxford is a card laying game with a steampunk gangster theme thrown on top of it. You'll be taking turns laying your syndicate cards around these cities, trying to have the most power present beside district cards. You have to lay your card down in a way that they are touching at least two different cards and that two corners are also touching. This is a very light little card game that plays quite fast and the strategy can be quite light as well. It is basically an area control game with some take that elements in it. I thought this was an okay little filler type game, giving it a 6.5 and it does some neat things for it coming in such a small package. Keeping it rolling, quickly moving to Psycho Killer. Psycho Killer is a party style game where players will be playing cards from their hands and drawing cards off of a deck. If you draw a Psycho Killer card, everyone reveals any weapon cards they have in their hand and get that many wounds depicted on their weapon cards. The cards you play will also do quirky little things that will add some unexpected twists into the game. The game ends when the fifth Psycho Killer is drawn and the player with the least amount of wounds wins. This game gives me the same feeling as Exploding Kittens, but just with a slasher killer theme. I give this a 6 rating, but if you do like games like Exploding Kittens or just enjoy the theme, you may enjoy this game as well. I do think this game will be broken out again once we get closer to Halloween as well. Flying to the next game, Wingspan. Wingspan is a widely popular game that came out in 2019 that won awards in almost every category it possibly could for board games. This is an engine building game with a theme of adding birds to your bird board, and there are hundreds of different birds in this game. There are four main actions you can take. Play a bird, get resources, get eggs, or get more cards. And whenever you play a bird in one of these regions, that action becomes stronger, plus you will most likely get some bonuses from those birds for taking that action. By the end of the game, when you are taking one of these actions, you are also probably taking several other actions that you get from previously played birds. This game ramps up very nicely and has some nice tension to the game because you don't really get that many actions in the four rounds that you play. I really love this game and it gets a 9 rating for me. It has some flaws, yes, but I have always had a great time when playing this game. 
Let's take a look at an older game now, Biblios. Biblios is an auction drafting card game that has two very distinct phases. The goal is to have the most power in a color in order to win that color's dice to earn however many points that dice is currently on. In the first phase, there is this push your luck sort of drafting mechanism where the current player will flip over cards one at a time and either take that card, put it in the auction draft, or put it out for the other players to draft from. And you can only take one card and put one in the auction pile. The second phase of the game, you will start auctioning the cards that are placed in the auction deck using the cards you got in the first phase until the whole auction deck is gone. Some cards will let you move dice up or down one point. At the end of the game, you reward players the dice of the colors that they won. And players with the most points from these dice wins. This is sort of a classic game now, and one I quite enjoy that I rate a 7.5. This one doesn't get broken out a lot these days, but when it does, I always enjoy it. Next game up is Wallet Party Game. Wallet Party Game, surprisingly enough, is a party game that utilizes this oversized wallet that you actually place the deck of cards inside of it that players will be pulling from throughout the game as well as putting cards back in. The cards in the wallet range from currency from a few different countries, IDs which will tell you what restrictions your player has, jewelry, police badges, and credit cards. You'll be trying to get the most money without going over what your ID says by gathering up and exchanging cards until time runs out. When time runs out, all players flip over all their cards and you must have an ID, money specified by your ID, and only two different types of currency. Anyone breaking these rules will be deemed guilty for that round. All other players get points depending on how much money they have. Play three rounds and player with the most points wins. I guess I had fun playing this game, but still only give it a six rating because I'm really not sure how many more times I would like to play this. But take that with a grain of salt because I just normally don't like party games that much. Let's now check out The Quest for El Dorado. The Quest for El Dorado is a deck building racing game where players will be trying to move swiftly through the terrain until they reach the famous El Dorado. On your turn, you will use your cards to either move your meeple or to buy new cards from the market to add to your deck. The cards are quite simple as they usually just depict a terrain type and a number for how much it can move you through that terrain. The game ends in a round that a player has reached El Dorado. If you are looking for a simple game to teach someone the deck building mechanic, this would be one of the top games I would suggest for that. I give this game a 7.5 rating, and though I did say it was a very simple game, I find it still to be quite engaging and give players a lot of tough decisions to make throughout the game. Moving on to a solo game now, Shah Razad. In Shah Razad, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, you will have two tiles in your hand, and on your turn you place a tile down adjacent to another tile, either above or below to make a column, or placing it to the left or right of a tile, but only connected by half the side. Your goal is to lay these tiles from smallest to highest from left to right. If any tile breaks that rule, it is flipped over and will count negatively towards your points. Also, if any chain doesn't go from the very left all the way to the very right, all those are flipped over and counted negatively as well. You will score by the largest grouping of each color. You play two rounds and count up your score to see how you did. This is one of those very relaxing, zen-like solo games that I tend to really enjoy. I give this game a 7 rating, and the fact that you can play this in about 10 minutes is one of those games that you could bring most places and play if you have a couple minutes to spare. Let's talk about the expansion of Lords of Waterdeep, Scoundrels of Skullport. I won't really talk much about the base game of Lords of Waterdeep, but just know it is a pretty simple worker placement resource management game with a D&D theme sort of pasted on top. I like the game quite a bit. I rate it an 8 even. This expansion is actually just two little expansions that I see no reason to add both if you are adding one. They add new, more interesting quests to complete, but my favorite thing it adds is this corruption track. You can go to these very strong action spots, but you will receive corruption tokens that will give you negative points at game's end, which will add a whole new element of strategy to this game. I will give this expansion an 8.5 because I don't think I will ever find it necessary to play without this expansion from now on. So that's pretty high praise from me. Done with that now, 
On to Forbidden Desert. Forbidden Desert is a cooperative game that is a follow-up to the Forbidden Island. But instead of being on a sinking island, you are in a desert that is having sandstorms and you are running out of water in your canteens. You will have to work as a group to uncover all four parts to your airship in order to make an escape. The choices will be hard as the eye of the storm will move around the board, throwing sand everywhere and covering up tiles that you will need to get to. As far as complexity, this is a little step up from Forbidden Island, but I think it still would belong in a gateway style genre of cooperative games. I give this game a 7 rating, and though I said it is a gateway style game, I still find it quite fun filled with exciting choices that will either let you escape or seal your fate trapped deep in the sands. Moving on to yet another party game this week with Codenames Duet. Codenames Duet is the two-player cooperative version of its predecessor, Codenames. In this, you will have 25 keywords in between the two players, and players will be going back and forth, giving each other one-word clues, trying to get the other player to guess certain cards before all your rounds are up. I will tell you right now, I'm not really a fan of the original Codenames. I find that game more stressful than fun for myself. But this two-player cooperative version of Codenames alleviated some of the stress for me, and I found myself enjoying it quite a lot more than I had anticipated. I'll give this a good 7.5 rating, which is really high for any party game for me. And by the way, as of writing this, I still haven't beat this, but I'm going to keep trying. Let's keep it rolling now with Planet. Planet is a tile drafting game where the tiles are actually magnets, and you will attach those tiles to your own personal planet ball you are building. Each of these tiles have regions on them like mountains, forests, deserts, oceans, or glaciers. You'll be trying to place these tiles in a certain way that align with the goal of these animal cards that are given out each round. If you win that goal, you take that animal card. The goals are different variations of having the biggest region of a certain type or having a big region that is touching another specific region and things like that. I thought this was a neat little gimmick they gave this game with the magnets and building an actual planet. It is a very simple game that I give a 7 rating to. I did enjoy this actually more than I thought I would, and is a nice little welcoming game that I'm excited to show some other friends. Moving on to the expansion for Knit of Lear. I've already talked about one expansion today, so why not talk about another one with the expansion of Knit of Lear, Thing of Lear. I reviewed Knit of Lear earlier this year and I really liked it, and I finally got this game to the table with this expansion. It is a really small expansion that doesn't add a ton which is usually a good thing to me. With this expansion, it adds the camp, which is almost another tavern. So if you win the right to draft from the tavern by going first, you may instead take something from the cave, which will either be a mercenary, which is a dwarf card that is versatile between two colors, or you can take an artifact card, which will do some pretty powerful things. This is a very easy expansion to add into the game and will always be played with the base game for myself. It does definitely ramp up the scoring quite a bit. I rate this expansion a 9 and is almost a perfect expansion for me and I'm really hoping they will keep making things for this game. And finally, the last game today is Food Truck Champion. In Food Truck Champions, each player plays as the owner of a food truck that is trying to expand. You will have to hire staff, gather ingredients, complete dishes, and try to win awards. On your turn, you will be taking cards that are multi-use where depending where you place them can be a new dish to make, a certain ingredient for other dishes, or be your new staff. This game uses a follow mechanic, where on other players' turns they can follow whatever the first player did by using cards in their hand or getting assisted by their already hired staff. I really like games that make everyone involved each turn and that use multi-use cards. This game gets a 7 rating from me, and the only reason it wasn't higher is that I feel like the game does drag on a bit, but other than that, I really did enjoy this one. Well, that should adjourn this meeting. Thank you all for watching. Let me know in the comments below what you think of some of these games. Have you played some of these games? What did you think? Did your tastes align with mine? If they didn't, no big deal. We're all a little bit different, aren't we? But if you did enjoy this video, make sure to like and subscribe to see more weekly content from me, Shane, at the board meeting in the future. I hope you all have an amazing day, and take care, everyone.